In this Q&A video, we pop down to Imperial College London, which is having this beautiful new building constructed so that we can answer the question, do I need to fuse down when connecting to a buzz bar? Now, just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of underfloor to desk wiring systems. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove that you've completed the course. This question has arisen because at the heart of this underfloor wiring system from Marshall Tuflex is this power track. The supply cable connects to this feed unit and the power track effectively plugs into the feed unit and then solid copper bars inside here run the length of the track and distributed throughout are these connection points which are effectively sockets. You can connect off them by means of these tap off units and these come in several variants. One of the options being a 32 amp unfused connector and a 13 amp fused connector. This is interesting because these tracks are rated at 63 amps, meaning you could feed them from a 63 amp protective device. So the 13 amp tap off unit makes sense because it's protecting the smaller conductors inside here with a fuse. But what about these conductors in the 32 amp version? What's protecting those? Only the 63 amp protective device at the source. So what gives? Well, let's think about it logically. What kind of protection do we need to offer to this conductor in the flexible conduit here after it's connected to the 63 amp buzz bar? Fundamentally, we need to provide overload and fault protection. There's also a need for additional protection as these generally feed socket outlets, but we'll cover that in a different video in this series. So we need to stop the load from drawing more current than the conductor can handle and to disconnect if a short circuit or an earth fault occurs. Let's think about overload first. Now normally we like to see an overload device at the point where the conductor size changes. The classic example being a consumer unit. The thick buzz bar goes into the bottom of the MCB and the spindly delicate lighting conductor comes out to the other side protected at say 6 amps. Or in a plug top where we go from the 2.5mm squared behind the socket to the flex on the plug with a 13 amp, 5 amp or 3 amp fuse offering protection. And it's fair to say that's excellent practice and means we can avoid some challenges. But it's not the only way we can provide overload protection to a conductor. Chapter 43 of BS7671 covers protection against overcurrent. Section 433 deals with overload current and 433.2 deals with the position of devices for protection against overload. 433.2.1 states, except where regulation 433.2.2 or 433.3 applies, a device for protection against overload shall be installed at the point where a reduction occurs in the value of the current carrying capacity of the conductors of the installation. Seems simple enough. Put the fuse or the MCB where the cable gets smaller, right? So how come we didn't need to with the tap-off point on the Marshall Tuflex power track system? Well, that regulation mentions exceptions, one of which is in 433.2.2, which reads, the device protecting a conductor against overload may be installed along the run of that conductor if the part of the run between the point where a change occurs in cross-sectional area, method of installation, type of cable or conductor, or in environmental conditions, and the position of the protective device has neither branch circuits nor outlets for connection of current using equipment and fulfills at least one of the following conditions. One, it is protected against fault current in accordance with the requirements stated in section 434. Two, its length does not exceed three meters. It is installed in such a manner as to reduce the risk of fault to a minimum, and it is installed in such a manner as to reduce to a minimum the risk of fire or danger to persons. So this regulation is telling us that the overload protection device doesn't have to go at the point where the change in cable size occurs. It can go somewhere along the length of the smaller cable. From an overload point of view, this makes perfect sense, as the section of cable before the protective device can never have more current flowing through it due to being overloaded, as the protective device will prevent that from happening. So applying this to the Marshall Tuflex system, we could say that the fuses on the plug tops at the other end of the tap-off unit prevent too much current being drawn through the 32 amp cable supplying the in-floor socket box. However, we still need to meet one of the two indents. Well, we can apply indent 2 in this case, because these tap-off units come in 3 meter lengths, they also come in 5 meter lengths, but we'll address that in a moment. But what about the rest of that reg? If you can install the cable so that the risk of a fault, fire or danger to a person is reduced to a minimum, then you can still have the protective device along the smaller conductor instead of at the beginning of it. So that's all good as these tap-off units are installed under floors and the cables are enclosed in metal flexible conduit. So by using them, we've reduced the risk of fault, fire or danger. The end of the second indent also points us to regulation 434.2.1, which relates to the other type of protection we need to provide for the cable, 
which is fault protection. Now, just before we get into that regulation, we'll need to give it some context by reading Regulation 434.2. It reads, Position of devices for protection against fault current. A device providing protection against fault current shall be installed at the point where a reduction in the cross-sectional area or other change causes a reduction in the current carrying capacitor of the conductors, except where Regulation 434.2.1, 434.2.2, or 434.3 applies. So pretty similar to what we read regarding overload protection. It goes on. The requirements in regulations 434.2.1 and 434.2.2 shall not be applied to installations situated in locations presenting a fire risk or risk of explosion or where special requirements for certain locations specify different conditions. So this is not the type of environment we're installing this system to. So we can use the options in the regs mentioned there. So now let's dive into 434.2.1. Except where regulation 434.2.2 or 434.3 applies, a device for protection against fault current may be installed other than as specified in regulation 434.2 under the following conditions. In the part of the conductor between the point of reduction of cross-sectional area or other change and the position of the protective device, there shall be no branch circuits or socket outlets and that part of the conductor shall, one, not exceed, three meters in length, and two, be installed in such a manner as to reduce the risk of fault to a minimum. And note, this condition may be obtained, for example, by reinforcing the protection of the wiring against external influences. Three, be installed in such a manner as to reduce to a minimum the risk of fire or danger to persons. So again, we've got that three meter length, which is one of the standard sizes that the tap-offs come in. The conductors are enclosed in the metal flexible conduit in line with the note about reinforcing the wiring system, and it's all factory assembled and fully tested before shipping. So the risk of fault has been reduced, and as they're installed under floors, above concrete and below metal plates, there's basically nothing to burn and no one to hurt. So all the indents of that have been met. Now, that all seems nice and simple and compliant. However, those of you paying close attention may have noticed that both of these regulations about the position of protective devices contain wording that may exclude application in this circumstance. Did you notice in regulation 433.2.2 that the device for overload protection can be put along the run of the tapped off conductor if it has neither branch circuits nor outlets for connection of current using equipment? And the floor boxes that these tap offs are designed to connect to do have branches if there's more than one socket connected. And they also allow for the connection of current using equipment. Regulation 434.2.1 is even more explicit, mentioning that branch circuits and socket outlets are not allowed in this situation. So how can this method of installation be compliant? Well, if we circle back to the 433 group of regulations, we find that there is an allowance for the omission of overload protection. In other words, it may not be needed at all. It starts in regulation 433.3 by stating that this regulation shall not be applied to installations situated in locations presenting a fire risk or risk of explosion or where the requirements for special installations and locations specify different conditions. So in the types of commercial and educational spaces this system is installed in, you're not going to come across those types of environment. Then regulation 433.3.1 and in particular indent 2 starts by saying a device for protection against overload need not be provided for a conductor which, because of the characteristics of the load or the supply, is not likely to carry overload current, provided that the conductor is protected against fault current in accordance with the requirements of section 434. So it could be argued that these floor boxes are very unlikely to ever draw 32 amps for a sustained period as they're generally used for IT equipment rather than, you know, three kilowatt heaters and so they won't get overloaded. But what about fault protection? Well, regulation 434.2.2 in the section of the regs covering fault protection states that the device protecting a conductor may be installed on the supply side of the point where a change occurs in cross-sectional area, method of installation, type of cable or conductor or in environmental conditions, provided that it possesses an operating characteristic such that it protects the wiring situated on the load side against fault current in accordance with regulation 434.5.2. So if the power track system is fed by a 63 amp protective device at the mains end, that could still provide sufficient fault protection for the tapped off floor box as long as the maximum ZS at the floor box is not above the maximum value. For example, if it's protected by a B63 MCB, table 41.3 gives a maximum ZS of 0.69 ohms, which in a large commercial installation should be easily achievable. So we can meet in spirit the requirements of the regulations for placing overload and fault protection not at the point of change, 
keeping the tap-off conductors to less than three meters, reinforcing the mechanical protection of the conductors, and installing them in a way that reduces the risk of fire and harm, while also meeting the requirements for remission of overload and providing fault protection at the supply end of the power track system. So it may seem a little unusual to be placing protective devices in positions that aren't at the point where the conductor sizes change, but there is an allowance to do it and still keep your circuits compliant and safe. Of course, if you need to install tap-off units with the five meter length of conductor and conduit, it becomes much harder to justify this method and you'd need to feed the power track with a 32 amp protective device to be fully compliant. So there we go, that's how we can connect 32 amp rated devices to a 63 amp supply. To find out where the RCD protection for the system goes, check out this video right here or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say thank you very much for watching.